Hello everyone, I am Dr. Shri Vanilla. Today's topic is Erythroplakia. What is Erythroplakia? Erythroplakia is applied to any area of reddened, velvety textured mucosa that cannot be identified on the basis of clinical and histopathologic examination as being caused by inflammation or any other disease process. Why it appears in reddish color? Absence of surface keratin layer and due to presence of connective tissue papillae containing enlarged capillaries projected close to the surface. This is resulting in reddish color appearance. Now let's learn classification. Erythroplakia is classified into homogeneous erythroplakia, erythroleukoplakia, granular or speckled erythroplakia. Homogeneous erythroplakia commonly occur on buccal mucosa with well demarcated margin. In erythroleukoplakia, erythroplakia interspersed with patches of leukoplakia. Granular or speckled erythroplakia. These are elevated lesions. Next. Now, let's learn about its etiology. Idiopathic, alcohol, smoking, candida infection are the causating factors of erythroplakia. Let's see one by one. Idiopathic. In most of the cases, cause for erythroplakia is not found. Next, alcohol and smoking. These can act as predisposing factors for erythroplakia. Next, candida infection. A secondary infection or super infection with candidiasis may be associated with dysplastic oral mucosal cells. Next. Now, Let's learn about its clinical features. Age and sex. It is most common in males than in females. And most common in 60 to 70 years old people. Next, sites. Erythroplakia occurs on all mucosal surfaces of the head and neck. Half of all cases are found on the vermilion or intraoral surfaces with the rest being evenly divided between the larynx and the pharynx. Vermilion lesions are relatively common and most often seen on lower lip. Next. Intraorally, the lateral and the ventral tongue, floor of the mouth, buccal vestibule, soft palate are the most frequently involved. Next. Now, let's know about the symptoms of erythroplakia. Erythroplakia, as the name obviously implies, is asymptomatic. Next, appearance of erythroplakia. Erythroplakia is non-elevated red macule or patch on an epithelial surface. Next, extent of erythroplakia. Unlike leukoplakia, erythroplakia is seldom multiple and seldom covers extensive areas of mouth. Unlike leukoplakia, erythroplakia seems seldom to expand laterally after initial diagnosis. Although this may be artifactual feature because most lesions are completely removed or destroyed immediately after formal diagnosis. Next, clinical features of homogeneous form of erythroplakia. It appears as a bright red, soft, velvety lesion with striped or scalloped, well demarcated margins. The typical lesion is less than 1.5 cm in greatest diameter and half are less than 1 cm. But lesions larger than 4 cm have also been seen. It is usually quite sharply demarcated from the surrounding pink mucosa and its surface is typically smooth and regular in coloration. Next, 
clinical features of granular or speckled form of erythroplakia. These are soft red lesions that are slightly elevated with irregular outlines and granular or finely nodular surface speckled with tiny white plaques. Next, clinical features of smooth erythroplakia. Smooth erythroplakia is soft to palpation. It has often described as having a velvety field. The pebble lesions tend to be somewhat firm, but erythroplakia never actually becomes hard or indurated until an invasive carcinoma develops within it. Next, clinical features of erythroleukoplakia. In erythroleukoplakia, erythroplakia admixed with or adjacent to leukoplakia in the mouth. The red areas are the sites most likely to contain or to develop dysplastic cells. These red areas are used for biopsy. Erythroplakia interspersed with patches of leukoplakia in which erythematous areas are irregular and often not as bright as homogeneous form. These are most frequently seen on tongue and floor of the mouth. The borders may be well circumscribed or blend indistinguishably with surrounding oral mucosa. Now, let's learn about diagnosis. Clinical diagnosis. Clinically, we can diagnose erythroplakia by observing red, well demarcated patch with no sign of infection and inflammation. Next, 1% toledin blue test. We can also do 1% toledin blue test. The solution is applied locally by swab or oral rinse. Malignant type retains it owing to increased nuclear DNA content of tumor cells. Next, laboratory diagnosis. In laboratory, biopsy exhibits epithelial changes ranging from mild dysplasia to carcinoma in situ and even invasive carcinoma. Next, now let's learn about differential diagnosis of erythroplakia. First one, candidiasis. In candidiasis, lesion can be rubbed off and it is commonly seen on tongue. Next, denture stomatitis. In denture stomatitis, unusually site is the palate or any denture bearing area. Next, tuberculosis. In tuberculosis, tuberculous ulcers are present which have rolled margins. Next, histoplasmosis. Histoplasmosis is more common in farmers and present as a single ulcer. Next, area of mechanical irritation. For area of mechanical irritation, cause can be identified. Next, macular hemangioma. For macular hemangioma, lesions blank on pressure. Next, telangiectasia. For telangiectasia, characteristic appearance seen on soft palate. Next, traumatic lesion. For traumatic lesion, cause can be identified. So, these are the differential diagnosis of erythroplakia. Next, now let's learn about management of erythroplakia. First and foremost is removal of cause. Elimination of a suspected irritant should be carried out. Next, incisional biopsy. Since erythroplakia is so closely correlated with severe dysplasia, carcinoma in situ and invasive carcinoma, incisional biopsy is especially indicated. Next, surgical stripping. A conservative surgical procedure such as mucosal stripping is often performed with minimal damage to the deeper connective tissues. Next, destructive technique such as laser ablation, electrocoagulation and cryotherapy. These have also proved to be effective. Next, most important in the treatment of erythroplakia is clinical follow-up. The key to therapy in this disease is extended clinical follow-up. Patients should be examined every three months for the first post-operative year. And also, patients should be examined every six months for additional four years. After that, annual re-evaluation 
with a thorough head and neck examination is advisable. Thank you everyone. Hope you all like my video. Please like, share and subscribe.